Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Coach Me Plus. Coach Me Plus is the leader in athlete management software and a product that we've been lucky enough to implement here for over two years now. The product in and of itself is exactly what you need it to be, guys, with options ranging from being a workout provider, as in sending the workout directly to the student athlete's phones, to being a place where you can communicate with them and bring together multiple streams of data to be its own dashboard for you, your coaching staff, or the athletes. Or you can use what we've added to our, our menu of Coach Me Plus activities, and that's the Hydration Station, where all of this information that is provided is based off of research from the Corey Stringer Institute, where we're looking at weighing in versus weighing out and then providing optimal hydration uh, strategies for the student athletes by them selecting through the menu and tapping on what they'll take home with them and what they're consuming prior to the next practice um, when all the numbers at the top are lined up green. It's something we've had really good success with and the kids have really bought in on. Just another great example of the awesome product that you can find at coachmeplus.com. Guys, hop over to coachmeplus.com today and check it out. It's a product I guarantee you won't be disappointed with. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content it provides, be sure to hop over and check out the community. The community is an exclusive members website that is just an extension of what we do here in July at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar. What it is is a combination of video lectures, a coach's corner with your Monday morning take-home information, and a forum where you can talk about anything and everything related to the field of strength and conditioning. In the community, you'll find content added each month from some of the top practitioners in the world, ranging from PhDs to high-level coaches, bringing you exactly what they're doing with their athletes or their research at the present moment. On top of that, an additional discussion by coaches bringing you that Monday morning information, things that you can add to your training program right away. Tying that in with the opportunity to discuss with coaches around the world in the forum on anything and everything from the topics addressed in these presentations to whatever you're seeing in your daily life as a coach. If this sounds like the right thing for you and your staff, go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and try it out for 48 hours for just a dollar. If you like it, you're signed up, ready to roll, and you're jumping into all the great content added each month. If not, feel free to go ahead and cancel at any time. No questions asked. We're really excited about what we're building in the community and hope you are too. Go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, I have the absolute pleasure of sitting down with Dana Sanchez to talk about her unique voyage to become the go-to person in the world of professional sports when it comes to increasing athletes' mobility, and teaching them better breathing mechanics. You know, we start out discussing her background and the role of work-life balance and how she's found it and how she got to actually be the mobility maker. We then get into her work with the WWE and professionals across all the major sports in the United States, and she shares with us, you know, what the aha moments are with them and how she actually teaches these guys and these women how to breathe, what's important with it, you know, where are the issues with the common thoughts that we have in it, and and a few small parlor tricks, as she refers to them, that can really help us get more from what we're trying to get our athletes to do. This, This is really an awesome talk. This is a very unique episode, you know, where there are just, this is like full of life lessons from everything to what it actually means to be a go-getter to, you know, putting yourself out there when you're looking to contact people to work with them and the importance of researching people. Like there's just, this is so full of gems. This is an absolutely awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Dana, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks. So for like the the one person that might be listening that doesn't know who Dana is. Let's give them the quick Cliff Notes, Spark Notes, Wikipedia version of what you're doing down there, how you got there, and and what you're building. Wow. Um, All right. Well, it's been a while, so I don't know how quick a a version there is, but um, I... 
I uh, am a mobility, breathing, and mind-body coach in professional sports. Uh, actually, if you ask my my nine-year-old son, he's like, "Mom, you have so many different jobs," um, because I do. I have a book that just came out, um, so I I suppose I'm an author. Um, I do a lot of writing. I've been writing for CNN um, as their yoga and fitness expert for. I think I'm going on five years with them. I've got almost 60 articles with them. Um, and then, and then again, working in professional sports. Um, I'm also an on-air fitness expert for a couple of the, the stations down here in the Tampa Bay area. And I think that's it. That's, uh, that covers, that covers the jobs. Um, yeah. And a mom. So I'm sure that you get to sleep quite often and, you know, have all the free time in the world that you would like. Well, you know, and everybody always says, oh, you're so busy, you're so busy. But it, in over the past few years, I've really learned how to prioritize my time. And so if you follow me on Instagram, you see that I post a lot of videos in my garage gym. And they're videos that just come out of my own training sessions because I prioritize that. I prioritize training sessions when I'm not traveling. I want to be in car line. Um, and for those of you who have kids and know what car line is, but like I want to pick my child up from school and not have to send him to the after school program. And I'll, I'll make choices sometimes about whether I take on a new client um, or not. And when I say a client, I don't really work with general population. So we're talking about like a professional athlete or not. It's like, well, will I be able to pick up my kid from school, you know, at least three of the five days this week, if I choose to work with them. And if the answer is no, then a lot of times the answer to the potential client is no, because I just, um, I, I, I don't think work life balance should be just this thing we talk about. I think it should be reality. And I try to I try to find, and I love my work, by the way. So that's the other thing. Like, I don't have to make time for vacations because when my husband and I go to like the NSCA event, even if one of us isn't speaking at it, we always go to the coaches conference and we joke. It's like our honeymoon every year because we hang out with all of our friends. You know, we go out drinking, we go out to dinner, you know, we're in a hotel. We don't have the responsibility of our kids, dogs, that kind of thing. So we've tried to go on vacation before and it's like, ah, the gym, you know, if this hotel isn't as nice as the one we have in our garage. So why do we bother? So, uh, yeah, I, I think that I've, I figured that out, um, in terms of like work life balance and the special recipe for that. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really awesome. So then let's go back 15 years from now and let's talk about what Dana was doing when she got her start. How did she get into diving into professional athletes? Where did she come up with this idea of separating the mobility and the breathing work that you do as a as its own kind of branch? And now I'm asking this, to be completely honest, selfishly, because we have a young woman that works with us who does yoga with a bunch of teams and she literally said you need a mobility coach and I was like you're right I just don't know how we would do it so how did it start how did you get into it and how did how did you build to where you are now uh well it was definitely an evolution um and and I always say that I didn't just like today I don't know what I don't know but back then I definitely didn't know what I didn't no, you know, um, we, we go into this thinking that we've got some of the answers only to find out that maybe, maybe there are different answers. Um, maybe there are different questions. So that means that when I, when I started back then it was, I was in, into yoga, like I wasn't a strength coach. Um, and in fact, I was only, I've had two two very different careers. I I was actually a director of marketing and public relations for an international corporate real estate firm. Um, and so I had like this big time executive job. I traveled all the time. So talk about no work life balance. So that's where that comes from and why I prioritize that now in my life and also making sure that my work is something that I really love because as much as I was good, very good at what I did. Um, 
I didn't love it. Uh, and it was for someone else. And I didn't feel like I was really helping anyone. It was corporate real estate. Like, who was I helping? Um, I wasn't helping people feel better or be happier. I mean, a lot of people were happy about all the money they made. But um, anyway, I did that for quite a long time. And to kind of balance out my stress level, that's when I started going to the gym. And um, it was on a business trip that I had found yoga because uh, I used to stay at all the nicest hotels and they'd have spas and, you know, yoga instructors like on call. And so I found it and I had done gymnastics as a kid. And I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, this is like adult gymnastics. This is so cool. But the thing that ended up resonating with me was the, the time at the end where um, this guy said, just, you know, just focus on your breathing, just lay there, do nothing and focus on your breathing. And I was never a do nothing person. Like I didn't even know. Initially I wanted to kill someone. I was like, I, this has to be over now. Is he going to ring a bell or something? I have to get up. Like my brain wouldn't stop. It was it's so intense. And then finally I just kind of let it go. And there's this feeling of, um, I don't know, tapping into a part of me that, that had more to say to me about what I really wanted and being able to clear away all of the ambition and all of that stuff to start to think about what was authentic to me. And I know this kind of feels sound sort of esoteric and out there, but, um, it's not, I mean, I'm a big science person. So then I was like, what is the science behind all of this? Like, what is the science behind this movement? Cause the yoga did make me feel better. Not, all of it though, some of the extreme stretching and that kind of stuff, I would do it because I was competitive and I, I wanted to be better than the person on the mat next to me, which is not yogic at all, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but that was just what I was, what I was bringing to the mat, which is very much like what a lot of these athletes bring to the mat, you know, when they go to practice yoga. So I understood the dangers of what happens when you let your ego and, and all of that get in the way. But I started to look into the science of the movement and why it would be making my body feel better and why if I practiced yoga after a flight, I was feeling better. And I started to look at Gray Cook. Um, and when I looked at Gray Cook's, I think it was his first book, what was Athletic Body and Motion? Mm -hmm. Nurse, your body in like balance, that. something like that. In balance, that's it. Yes, and and so you look through it, and it's like these are all yoga postures, except they're explained from a biomechanics perspective, and it makes a whole lot more sense than. And forgive me, all the yoga people, but that it, it makes a lot more sense than you know an eighty pound Indian guy who practices yoga eight hours a day and can twist his body into a pretzel because he can. Like I like the concept of let's move this way because this is how the body is supposed to function and this is going to create more function and better performance. And so that resonated. But in the meantime, I still was made, had to make a living with this other job. Um, but it was driving me more and more nuts. And now that I had this peek into what it felt like to not be so stressed out and to actually be tapping into this authentic self and, you know, the ability to think about what I really valued and to look at the fact that I had, you know, nannies raising my kids and I was traveling all over and it, the first couple of years, it was so exciting to be playing golf on all these amazing golf courses, doing all of this. And then it was like, but is this what I really want? Is this what my life is about? And um, I was offered a book deal about my life story because uh, it, around this time when I started to make all these changes, this was, I had, when I had discovered yoga and I was basically at the top of my game in terms of corporate marketing and all of that. And I was, I was offered this book deal because I had happened to mention to someone something about how my life started out. I was a really poor kid. I came from a really poor background. Um, and which probably not probably definitely led me to strive for a life that I thought was the antithesis of what I had grown up in. Right. So I, I thought money would be the answer, money, prestige, having this big job, you know, having a lot of things, that was going to be the answer, but I still felt really, really kind of shallow and, um, like there wasn't a lot of substance. 
And that became glaringly clear to me when, um, when I was offered this book deal and they wanted me to write my life story to try to inspire other people and motivate them to create this life I created. And I was like, holy shit, this isn't what I want anyone to have. Uh, cause it, it feels so fake and am I really happy? And, and as I started to look at all of that, I, decided that I wanted to take it all apart. And the one thing that I really did enjoy and was um, was excited about was learning more about how the body moved and, and this thing that was having this huge impact on me, which was yoga. And I took, I, while I was traveling for my job, I had taken all these different yoga certifications so that I could become a Yoga Alliance certified yoga instructor and all of that. But in the background, I was still learning more about what Gray Cook had to offer and trying to get into the science of it. And uh, in the circles that I was in, I was around like owners of pro sports teams and because these people with tons of money, right? And um, and I was around professional athletes and I happened to, to be at, staying at the same hotel as um, a particular team. And... Um, I won't go into who it was, but uh, some pretty famous athletes. And back then, 15 years ago, think about it. They weren't like mobility. It wasn't even a word that you really used in training. Um, strength and conditioning, especially in base professional baseball, wasn't even really a big deal. Uh, because the way that baseball had previously worked was baseball players had jobs in the off season, you know, before they got paid tons of money. And one of my first clients was Terry Francona. And he used to tell me about how that used to work where, you know, you had to have a real job because you weren't making all that money. Um, and then when you showed up at spring training, spring training was really your only opportunity to get into shape to play baseball. Cause you didn't have time for all that off season training in the, in the off season. So anyway, um, you know, that, that, that things have evolved definitely. And I was, I was in on that evolution, like learning as they were learning that mobility and movement was a big part of it. And so I got in right at the right time. Cause I was like, well, there's something to this yoga because I'm finding there's something to this yoga. I've always loved sports, you know, let's take a closer look at how this could fit. And there was interest. And, um, so I did write, I self-published a book about I, um, back then called Yoga is Not One Size Fits All. And I did that when I decided I was going to leave this corporate career. I was going to start a yoga career. I looked at opening a yoga studio. But again, there was just this voice that was saying, this whole yoga thing, you can't really embrace it completely. You wouldn't, like the people who walk into a yoga studio who are all about yoga, that's not me. I was more all about sports the science behind it, um, learning more about like mindfulness, meditation, the science behind it. And it's so cool because when I got into this, that's when everyone was just starting to look at the science behind all of this. Now, mindfulness isn't this like airy fairy kind of thing anymore. You know, people really take it seriously, which is very cool. And I was part of that wave of um, when we were looking at that and deciding to take it seriously and knowing that like mental performance was part of the whole thing. And, but again, I only had training as a yoga instructor when I first started, I lucked out because, um, I had that marketing background and I, I, I've told the story on quite a few different podcasts, but, um, I, I like to repeat it because I think it's a good lesson for people uh, that we didn't have, e well, we had an email back then, but we didn't have like direct message. You couldn't just reach out to anybody on, you know, social media and send them a quick note. You, you had to actually, uh, research people. And e even back then, like the internet connections, it took time. You had to be a lot more patient than you are now, but that was a good thing. Um, so what I decided was I wanted to to start to work in professional sports, bring yoga to professional sports. It didn't exist that like the URLs for yoga, for baseball, yoga, for football, yoga, for, um, hockey, yoga, for basketball. I own them all because nobody, nobody was really doing this yoga for sports. I own that one. No one, no one was doing this. So I bought all these URLs. I wrote this book, yoga is not one size fits all, um, where I was looking at the different areas of the body. Now my approach is completely different. Remember I said, I didn't know what I didn't know back then, but that was, that was my, um, 
my education at the time. So I was looking at different areas of the body and the different positions and exercises you could use that came from yoga that were more yoga inspired. And so I separated out this book into like, I've got hips and hamstrings and T spine and shoulders. And, and, um, and I, I went through the book and I earmarked pages that were specific to different sports. I went through the four major sports that I was familiar with hockey, basketball, uh, football, and baseball. And I found out who for every single team, every single team in every one of those sports, I found out who the um, manager or the head coach was, depending on which sport it is, um, the head athletic trainer, uh, the um, head strength coach, and then I picked three of the players from every team. So that's six different um, people that I'm reaching out to on every single team from every single sport those four major sports. And, but I also looked up where they went to school, like what was their background? Where were they before they were at that team? Um, with the particular players, I looked at the different teams they'd been at their injury history, anything that I, where I had a connection to them, where I could reference someone that we both knew or where I could say in my book, here's an area that, you know, I think this would be beneficial to you based on the fact that, you know, you've had multiple shoulder surgeries and um, I found that these particular positions were or whatever. I didn't send a form letter. I spent about 80 hours of time putting together these individual letters. And then I took the copy of the book. It was earmarked um, the, the letters and I had to look up where to send them. Um, and in some cases, I'd send them to two different places because if I couldn't tell like where whether they'd be at like, let's say it was baseball, if they'd be at um the rehab complex or the main stadium. So sometimes I sent two because I wanted to make sure they got them. And they did get them because my phone just started ringing. It was incredible. And usually the response was, I've never gotten anything like this. You know, I get marketing packages all the time. I never get something that is, it was so clearly specifically to them. The first person who called me was Terry Francona. Um, but I, I had about a 37% response rate to that mailing and having been in marketing, a three to 4% response rate is like, holy crap, that's a really successful campaign. But because it was so personalized and, um, and I was based in Boston then I ended up working with, um, with, Terry Francona and members of the Red Sox, because he was the manager at the time. I um, worked with Tim Thomas, the goaltender from the Boston Bruins. Um, I worked with a couple of the Patriots, and then I also worked with the Celtics as a team. So, like, I got all the Boston sports teams covered. Also, at that time, I got um, hired by the Boston Fire Department, and I think I was probably the first yoga trainer to a fire department in the United States, probably. Um, I mean, it just wasn't a thing, but it became a thing. They really, I loved working with them. Um, I'm blessed now to, I get to work with special operations and, and, uh, first responders and, and tactical athletes. And so that's really cool. But that was the start of it way back then. Um, yeah, so I, uh, that was how I got my foot in the door. And then now I'm down here based in Florida. And that really started when the Rays called me to invite me down to work with them for spring training. So I came down for three weeks to work with the Rays. And that was back in 2006, I want to say. Um, so they were the first uh, professional baseball team where I did spring training with them. And now I run around just to all the different spring training camps around me. Um, but I never take it for granted. I mean, I know how it all started out and it was so exciting. And along the way, as I said, this evolution of learning and becoming going from a yoga coach to uh, um, a mobility coach, a breathing coach, like learning more about breathing biomechanics. I didn't know anything about breathing other than what I was taught in yoga, which I learned really is it wasn't based on any kind of biomechanics that made any sense. Um, so what I teach has evolved, um, how I work with teams definitely has evolved and it's all been through continually learning. And I'm sure, you know, five years from now, the way that I, I, I work is, is going to continue to change. 
I love that. And for anyone that's listening, watching, if you haven't listened, I think it was probably the the best story where you got into the most of it was with Anthony, like the background. Was that on the Stop and Give Me 20 with Anthony Reyna? Oh, yeah. yeah. So if, if you want to dive more into that, check out Anthony's show with Dana on the Stop and Give Me 20 podcast because there, there's a lot behind where you got, you know, to where you are today. Um, but I want to talk about your work with athletes and, and more importantly, like what you see and, and what are some of like the, the positive improvements is obviously just a cliche term, but where are some like breakthrough moments that you've seen? Because it's not just athletes. There's some performers too involved, correct? You work with, am I mistaken that you also had some time with some, some guys in the squared circle? The WWE? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I still work as a mobility um, consultant for them. Yeah, they're awesome. But I, they are truly athletes. Like, I, um, yes, they're performers, too. But, I, you know, people will say to me, yeah, but it's fake. And I'm like, do you know how much athleticism and skill it takes to, to, to not only protect yourself from injury when doing those moves, but also protect the person that you're, oh. you're working with. Like that's, that's incredible. So to fake it, like it, 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 I just wish there was a different word that I could use for that because it's not staged. We like to say staged. Those of us right. that are really into it. It's not fake. It's staged. It's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, my husband says to me all the time, what do you mean it's not real? And he's kidding, but it's hilarious. But it's, I just find that they have to work. There's a whole extra element of what they have to do in order to keep themselves and the people that they're wrestling safe. And it's, it's insane. I love them. I love them. I, they're my favorite. So, and everybody knows, like even the, of the baseball player, it, no, it doesn't matter. The WWE is my absolute <laughs> favorite. I love working with them. They're so happy too, because that's the other thing. They don't have to worry about losing, right? <laughs> they, they're not going to be upset that they lost a match because it's kind of scripted, right? <laughs> so there isn't that extra layer. And, and um, Sean Hayes, who is the head of strength and conditioning for the WWE, is one of the most talented strength coaches that I have ever had the privilege to work with. And I absolutely love him. So the, the whole thing, I it just... I love it. I love working with my husband too, by the way. I should probably throw that in there since he's head of strength and conditioning for the Toronto Blue Jays. That's fun too, but I get to see him all the time. So WWE, hands down. That's awesome. Yeah. So, but this is a unique kind of niche in what we do. Where have there been some difficulties with athletes that you've had that have turned into big break, uh, breakthroughs for them? Where all of a sudden something is just like, and they're like, wait a minute. This is important. Oh, it's breathing every time. It's breathing. Like they'll they'll downplay it. I've had I've had athletes say to me, "Yeah, breathing. Uh, hello, I'm alive. So apparently, I'm doing it right." <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, uh, but getting them to understand that breathing is a movement pattern and a movement a fundamental movement pattern that impacts other movement patterns and and showing them and especially like with pitchers um it's been it's definitely been breakthrough for a lot of them because i don't stretch shoulder joints i i don't really have to do a whole lot of manipulating of shoulder joints uh pec tension that kind of thing when i can change breathing mechanics to make them more optimal I then change rib cage position and I mobilize ribs and which helps establish a better scapular position and better stability and mobility throughout the whole shoulder girdle. Um, and, and that, that has an impact and, and pitchers can see it. And, you know, I, I call them kind of parlor tricks. And I stole that from a friend from PRI because he would call his stuff 
parlor tricks, but I don't do strict PRI and I want to make that very clear. I've taken eight courses in PRI and I am very grateful to PRI for introducing to me the fact that breathing is a movement pattern. It was a game changer. The first PRI course I took my friend Eric Cressy um, told me, yeah, I needed what he had just started taking PRI. He's like, oh my gosh, Dana, you need to, you need to check this out. It's really good stuff. Um, I did check it out. It was, uh, it was heavy. It's very heavy. Um, and in the context of the work that I do, I'm not a physical therapist. I'm not an athletic trainer. I don't always have access to a table. Um, also in the work that I do, I can't have guys blowing up balloons or blowing into straws cause I'm usually in a corner of the weight room and we'd be laughed out of the weight room. And not that I'm not saying that it's not effective. It just wasn't effective for me in the context of my work. So I had to figure out based on what I learned from PRI and then reading other materials, looking at the research behind, um, breathing biomechanics. And I can't believe that we're not all taking a closer look at breathing. It seems like it's definitely going to be like a face palm for people, you know, 30 years from now when everybody understands how fundamental breathing is to movement. Um, but anyway, it, and especially looking at the diaphragm as a core and postural muscle, it's just, it influences absolutely everything. I can change hip movement. I can change posture. I can change so much by changing breathing mechanics and, and, and optimizing breathing mechanics. Um, but, but I, I have going back to the parlor tricks. So I've, I've come up with a way to use five breaths and I do this whenever I'm out teaching about breathing, um, biomechanics as well, like for perform better and the NSCA and the other places that I'm, I'm blessed to be able to, to, um, share the stage with so many cool people. But I show people how you can have an immediate response to um, internal shoulder rotation with just five breaths, changing how the ribs actually move, taking the emphasis off. And I know a lot of people don't like this, but taking the emphasis off the belly because belly breathing, it, I'm sorry, it's just wrong. You, we have no long tissue in our bellies. Um, and if you put the emphasis on the belly, you take the emphasis away from the lungs and the ribs. And guess what? It's respiration. Yeah. <laughs> breathe into your lungs, your diaphragm is the muscle that you should be concerned about. And rib movement is essential for diaphragm function. And the fact that not every person understands that, that's a problem because that's the basis for the mechanics of how it works. Your ribs actually have to internally and externally rotate for the diaphragm to contract and relax. So if your ribs stay in a semi um, externally rotated or kind of flared position all the time, that means your diaphragm remains pretty much in a semi contracted state all the time. So it, you can't breathe deeply. Even if you push your belly out and you force a diaphragm contraction, that isn't functional. So that's why a lot of people love to go to yoga and they do their belly breathing, but they're not training their body to breathe optimally. They're just enjoying what it would be like if their diaphragm could actually function right. So they, they can get parasympathetic. They're breathing deeply. They're forcing that diaphragm contraction, but it's not functional. So they leave their mat and they're not not thinking about breathing into their belly anymore so it's not working but guess what if you think about breathing into your lungs mobilizing your ribs your body's like yeah this is how it's supposed to work and because it's a functional pattern you can train your body to then start to do that functional pattern without you having to think about it you can't do that with belly breathing and I will argue that with the best of the best because I have researched this over and over and over and I've worked with so many hundreds of people at this point to optimize their breathing mechanics and and create a pattern that they can own you can't own belly breathing but you can own diaphragmatic breathing that mobilizes ribs so I can show someone how to do that in five breaths and then immediately give them up to like 30% of internal shoulder rotation. Now they don't own it. And I make that very clear. That's why it's a parlor trick. I, because whatever pattern they've been compensatory pattern that they, if they've um, adopted over the years, whether it was because of stress, poor posture, the way that they move their bodies, um, like repetitive movement, an injury, whatever it is, we're not going to undo it in five breaths and have them own it. 
However, the coolest thing is that I found that within two weeks of them actually just practicing that for two sets of five breaths in an optimal position where they actually get their ribs to move, they can own it after two weeks. So they can own that additional 30 degrees of internal shoulder rotation that's stable and mobile. We didn't make the joint lax by stretching it out to give them you know, that uh, um, extra rotation that eventually is going to cause other problems. We gave them real functional movement. So that is, going back to your original question, that's the big like aha mo moment for these guys where, wait a minute, I thought breathing could help me sleep better. It can. I thought breathing could help me de-stress. It can. But I didn't know that breathing could help me move better. And it can. It uh, absolutely can. It's crazy. I love it. I love it. And I think that the ability to do it quick, precise, and put it in their face that, look at this, it's doing what it's supposed to, uh, yeah. obviously it's got to be exceptionally impactful. It is, especially too when there's a language barrier. Because if you think about yeah. you know all the work we do in baseball, I've got a lot of Latin guys, and um, as much as I've tried to learn Spanish, I suck at it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just laughable. But I can show them, and it's not it's not even just the language barrier. You know, people make decisions based on emotions um, more than logic. So I could I could explain to the smartest person, you know, how this all works and why it works. Or I could show them they're going to be more apt to believe it if they feel it, if they see it, you know? A hundred percent. I love that. I love that. Well, listen, let me let me get you out of here on this. Where are people going to be able to see more, find more, get more about what's going on, what you're putting out, and especially, you know, the you have at least one more book. I have at least one more book. Right, because you've got the, the back pain book too. Yeah, well, don't nobody should read that first book. <laughs> Remember, I didn't know what I didn't know. Don't even look it up. I had a different last name. Hopefully, you can't find it. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, the back pain book is Practical Solutions for Back Pain Relief. That came out in January. Um, I, I have been talking to Human Kinetics about a book about breathing. Um, so that may be something that happens in the in the future. Um, but my, my website, uh, I've been working on a big redesign because I want to give people free resources. I believe uh, that breathing is a superpower and, um, I want, I want to get people to breathe better. It helps people feel better. Um, so my website is going to have tons of free resources right now. There's a kind of like a coming soon page. I mean, it's the same website I've had forever. It's mobilitymaker.com. But um, they can sign up for my email on that coming soon page by by the middle of July at the very latest. Uh, it will be up to date. I'll have blog posts on there, all the free resources. I'll also have programs that you can buy. Um, I do have to make a living. And uh, but I, my goal is to make that the place where people can find all kinds of good stuff. However, in the meantime as well, on Instagram, um, that's my favorite social media platform. And I try to put good stuff out on um, on Instagram every day. So that's at Mobility Maker. I'm Mobility Maker on all social platforms. So that's where they can find me. And then also um, I speak at the Perform Better Summits this year for the NSCA I was at TSAC, but I'll also be at the Personal Trainers Conference. I think that's in Baltimore in October. Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking at the World Golf Fitness Summit in Orlando. That's also in October um, through TPI. So, yeah, I hope to meet a bunch of people who are hearing this, so, you know. And if they if they heard this, definitely come up, tell me, you know, that, that they did. Feel free to reach out to me on email. It's Dana at mobilitymaker.com. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, Dana, I can't thank you enough for your time. This is fantastic. People are going to love it. Great. Yes. All right. Well, we'll be in touch real soon. And a huge thank you to Dana Santes for spending the time with us today. Guys, I mean, open, honest, candid. What else could we ask for? And really, you know, a, a person who went out there and was just a go-getter, went after it, and, and made it happen. Just so many awesome lessons you can take from this talk. This is 
already one of my favorite episodes we've ever had. And I can't thank Dana enough for spending the time with us today. Guys, make sure you get over to mobilitymaker.com. Make sure you're giving her a follow at mobilitymaker. Um, she wasn't kidding, man. Her IG feed is off the chain. Like, Make sure you're following her because she's putting out great stuff every day. And as always, guys, if you enjoyed the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. We're just trying to get the best information out there to all the awesome coaches that we can. So please share away, pass it on. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.